Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. So far in this podcast, we've looked at aircraft from Germany, the UK, the USA, Japan, and Russia. Does anyone notice a glaring omission? Listener Matthew from Down Under did, and he requested that we look at the Italian fighter plane, the Machi C-202 Folgore. And that is exactly what we're going to do today. Oh, were some of you saying France? Oh yes, we will do a French aircraft before too long. But first, there is the problem of how to pronounce some of the Italian words in this episode. Luckily, I have an Italian speaker to help us out in this regard. So let's take a moment and listen to a piece of uh, recording that we made earlier. Okay, so today I need some help with some of the pronunciations of these uh, Italian words that are part of this uh, episode. So I have the lovely Rita who's helping uh, helping me out with uh, eight terms that I, I really needed some help out with. So uh, say hello, Rita. Hello, everybody. All right. So the first one, okay, the manufacturer of the airplane is it's Machi or Maki? Maki. Maki. Okay, that's good. And the particular name of the airplane we're looking at today is the Folgore. Is that it? Exactly. Folgore. Very nice. Okay. Now, the next one, we're getting a little bit more complex here. So, how do I say this, this term here? Regia Aeronautica. Regia Aeronautica. Bravo. Oh, good. So, that's, that's like Air Force, right? Mm. All right. <laughs> The next one. All right. This one is this one's a tough one. So I'll just let you take a shot at it. Isotta Fraschini Asso Mille. Isotto Fraschini Asso Mille. Isotta. Isotta. All right. Good. Thank you so much. Um, the next one is is it Monsone? Exactly. Nice. Monsone. Monsone, which means monsoon. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Next one, again, this one's a bit tough. Africa Sententrionale. Oh, Africa is no problem, but Sententrionale. Yes, just watch <laughs> how you roll your R's. I will roll my R's, okay. Next one, Squadrilla. Exactly, perfect. Okay, and that's like a squadron, I guess. Exactly. Sergente Pilota, is that it? Sergente Pilota. Very good. Sergente Pilota. Excellent. Good nice. job. All Bravo. right. Thank you so much, Rita. Bienvenuto. <laughs> All right. So now that we are armed with the vocabulary, let's start talking about the C-202 Folgore. Design and development. Mario Castoldi was born on February 26. 1888, in Zimbido, San Giacomo, near Milan. He grew up to be an engineer and aircraft designer. In 1922, he had started working for the Aeronautica Maci Company. This Italian company had come into existence firstly as the Newport Maci Company in 1912, when Giulio Maci's small coachmaking company started building French-designed Newport aircraft under license for the Italian military. The factory was right beside Lac Varense, which was convenient because they also started building flying boats. Now Maci and Castoldi had a need, a need for speed. And in the interwar years, this need coalesced on an obsession for winning the Schneider Trophy. Now, you may have heard of this trophy in relation to the development of the Spitfire. But of course, the Brits weren't the only ones striving to win this prestigious award. So what was the Schneider Trophy anyway? The full name of the award is the Coupe d'Aviation Maritime Jacques Schneider. Jacques Schneider was a wealthy French balloonist and boat racer who had been bitten hard by the aviation bug when he met Wilbur Wright in 1908. 
Sadly, his actual flying career was cut short by a racing boat accident in 1910 when he stopped doing actual daredevil activities. But he stayed involved in aviation and noticed that seaplane development was starting to lag behind that of land planes. So, on December 5, 1912, Schneider announced that he was going to start a race for the fastest seaplane. It would be an annual time trial over a triangular course of 280 kilometers, and the winner would get the prize. If any country could win three times in a row, it would get to keep the trophy permanently. Schneider commissioned an impressive trophy made out of marble and silver and bronze, topped by a sculpture of a depiction of a zephyr, which is a goddess representing the wind, skimming over a breaking wave, surrounded by Neptune, the god of the sea, and octopus and crabs. The actual trophy cost 25,000 francs, and it came with a purse of prize money. The winning entry would get the trophy for the year, and its country would host the next year's race. In the beginning, the race was held between manufacturers and aero clubs who would hastily convert one of their products for the friendly and fun rivalry of the race. But things changed in the 1920s, when the quest for the Schneider Trophy turned into something more resembling the space race, and the races seemed more like an actual moonshot. The governments of the UK, France, the USA, and Italy plowed money into their country's entries for the national prestige of winning. Italy had been at the forefront of the competition in the early years. They won three times in 1919, 1920, and 1921, and would have been able to keep the trophy permanently if the 1919 entry hadn't been disqualified for not rounding a buoy properly. The race had been held in an intense fog, and there was such a spat over the disqualification that no one won the award that year. But the next race was held in Italy. Italy wasn't to win for the next three years, and it was in this mix of competition, national shame, and hyper-nationalism that Benito Mussolini got involved. He decided that returning the trophy to Italy would restore national pride and show the superior capabilities of his fascist state. He instructed the Italian aircraft industry to, in quotes, win the Schneider Trophy at all costs, close quotes. And his government put money where its mouth was. Macchi and Castoldi, were tasked with designing and building the machine to restore the pride of Italy. The M39 was a purpose-built racer designed only for winning the Schneider Trophy. It was a low-wing, single-seat monoplane powered by a 600-horsepower Fiat AS2 liquid-cooled V12 engine. They went to great lengths to reduce the drag, for example, putting radiators for engine cooling lying flat on the surface of the wing. The pilot flew from a cockpit sunk so low in the fuselage that the windscreen was profiled into the nose decking to reduce aerodynamic drag. As the course circuit required left turns, the left and right wingtips were not equal to allow it to make tighter left-hand turns. The plane's floats contained the fuel, but were also loaded specifically so that the unequal weight would better allow left turns, as well as to counteract the engine torque. They built five of this model for the 1926 race attempt. Two were trainers, and three would fly in the race. On the 16th of September, 1926, the captain of the Italian team stalled out and crashed one of the trainers over Lake Veres and was killed. But this did not stop the Italian effort. Uh, Mussolini had said, at all costs. In November, the race was held in Hampton Roads, Virginia, USA. One of the Italian machines burst a pipe and had to drop out of the race, 
but the one piloted by Major de Bernini won the race with a speed of 246 miles per hour, and Italian pride was restored. Now, I don't know which is more stressful, getting the trophy in 1926 or trying to keep it in 1927 when the race was to be held at home in Italy. For the 1927 race, Machi built the M52, which was even lighter than the previous year's entry and had a more powerful 1,000 horsepower Fiat engine. Everything looked good for the three Italian aircraft entered in the race, except that all three had engine troubles during the race and all three had to drop out. Imagine Italy's shame. The British entry, a Supermarine S5, won that year. There was no race in 1928, as it had been decided that the competition should be run every two years, so that teams had more time to develop their machines. In 1929, Italy again tapped Mario Castoldi and Maci to build their entry for the competition. The result was the Machi M67, which had the same weight-saving features as the M52, but also had a new super engine. The Isotto Franci Asso Mille was an 18-cylinder engine, with the cylinders arranged in a W shape. It could crank out 1,798 horsepower. It also had an annoying habit of exploding on the test bench. Things did not look good when in August 1929, Regia Aeronautica, the Italian Air Force, Captain Giuseppe Mota, was killed when the M67 that he was testing crashed into Lake Garda in northern Italy. Italy asked the Brits to postpone the race to tinker with their cantankerous engine but the Brits, who were hosting, refused. The Italians brought three aircraft to the race, two of the new M67s and one of the older M52s. They knew that things were not good, but they went for honor and to save face. One M67 dropped out of the race with blinding smoke in the cockpit. The other had a radiator burst, scalding the pilot. But both planes landed and the pilots survived. The older M52 finished the race, but in second. The Brits had won again with their Supermarine S6. For the 1931 race, Mario Castoldi and Machi went for broke with the MC72. They went back to Fiat for their engine, and what an engine it was. Fiat took two of their supercharged V12 engines and coupled them in a tandem fashion, driving two counter-rotating propellers. The beast produced 2,500 to 3,100 horsepower. In order to cool the monster engine in the most aerodynamic way possible, flush-mounted radiators were placed on the wings, floats, and fuselage. Sadly, they did not get the engine perfected for the race, and the Brits flew unopposed with their Supermarine S6B, winning the trophy forever. The Italians didn't give up on their MC-72, and with continuing support from the Mussolini government, Mario Castoldi and Maci continued working on the plane. Eventually, it flew at an average speed of 440 miles per hour, which became the speed record for piston engine seaplanes. This record has never been broken until this day. The Machi and Supermarine companies would never compete for a trophy again, but would soon be meeting in a much more serious competition, aerial combat. Prototypes The C-202 Folgore was born out of a desire to upgrade an earlier model, the Machi C-200. The 200 looks a bit like a Hawker Hurricane, but with a radial engine. Although the 200 would serve throughout the war and even later as a trainer, 
By 1939, Machi was already looking to build something with more performance that could keep pace with contemporary British and German fighters. Mario Castoldi was still the company's chief of design, and that, incidentally, is where the C designation comes with Machi aircraft. As I said earlier, they were looking to up the performance, and in order to do that, desired more streamlining in the new aircraft. One of the advantages to inline engines is that compared to some others, such as radials, they have a smaller front face. The problem was that for a good 10 years, Italian doctrine had been to use radial engines. This is interesting considering how all those Machi racing planes used inline engines and not radials. On the other hand, those racing planes had been known to have a lot of engine trouble. Anyway, now that they wanted an inline engine, an Italian industry just didn't have any. In July 1939, it was decided to buy a German Daimler-Benz DB601A, which was a supercharged, liquid-cooled, inverted V12 engine rated at about 1,200 horsepower. This was the same formidable engine that powered the Dornier DO215 and the Messerschmitt BF109, 110, and ME210. The experiment worked, and so in November, Alfa Romeo bought a license to produce the DB601A as the Alfa Romeo RA1000 RC41 Monzone. While Alfa Romeo got to work building the new power plants, Castoldi designed a fuselage that would accept the imported DB601 and used existing Machi C200 wings, undercarriage, vertical and horizontal tail units to build the new fighter. Again, in a copy of the C200, the left wing was extended by 8.5 inches to produce more lift and thus offset the torque to the left due to the rotation of the propeller. Two 12.7 millimeter or half inch Breda Safa machine guns were mounted in the engine cowling with a synchronizing unit slowing the rate of fire to allow shooting through the Piaggio P1001 three-blade variable pitch constant speed propeller. There was space for 700 to 800 rounds. Fuselage fuel tanks were located behind the engine and behind the pilot with two more in the roots. Total fuel capacity was 430 liters or about 114 US gallons. The design would be described as tough yet small with great attention paid to aerodynamics. One fault was the complexity of the fuselage design, which would prove to be a problem later. Just seven months after the start of the project, and only a couple of months after Italy's entry into the war, the single prototype flew to the Regia Aeronautica's main test airfield at Gidonia, where it was put through its paces. Pilots were pleased. The aircraft clocked a speed of 375 miles per hour, and it could claw its way up to 18,000 feet in just six minutes. The new engine and the updated airframe had made it nicely and were found to be very strong, which allowed steep diving. Lastly, as a bonus, the new aircraft kept the great maneuverability of the C-200. The Folgori was a hit, and the Regia Aeronautica ordered as many as it could get. Production There were two main problems to the Regia Aeronautica getting as many Folgoris as it could want. The number one issue was the complexity of the design, which was not well suited to mass production. It took up to 22,000 man-hours to build a Folgore, while in comparison it took only four to 6,000 man-hours to build a BF-109. Even if they could speed up the production of the Folgore, there still wouldn't be enough engines to power them. Alfa Romeo was never able to make enough of their version to keep up and Italy had to continue purchasing DB601s from Germany, which probably was loath to part with them as they were in short supply there too. Operational History 
The Fulgore was rushed into operation in Malta and North Africa in mid-1941, before all the bugs could be worked out, and even before pilots could be properly trained. Problems with defective oxygen systems caused many aborted missions, and may have contributed to losses and fatalities. Unreliable radio sets were annoying and caused major problems when they failed and the pilots were forced to resort to the old World War I flyers' communication techniques of hand signals and wing waggling. Finally, there was also a shortage of spare parts to keep the type in service. In July 1941, the new Fulgores first started tangling with the British forces, and the Brits were impressed. Squadron leader Dennis Harry Clark reported that the Fulgores were sleek, surprisingly fast, and capable of outturning our P-40s with ease. They were able to pull away effortlessly into a climbing roll-off, or roll off the top when things at all became hectic. Their aircraft was superior to ours on all counts. The oxygen mask system problems continued until finally the Italians started using the German Draeger oxygen system that was in their BF-109s. Over Malta between September to November 1941, the Fulgores did very well and proved superior to the Hurricanes, although almost immediately it was recognized that the two nose-mounted guns were just not enough. They were even able to hold their own against the supermarine Spitfires that began arriving. The Fulgores could outturn a Spitfire, but the Spitfire, even with its lighter 303 machine guns, outgunned the Fulgores. The Fulgores flew fighter operations, ground attacks, and aerial reconnaissance missions. In the end, the greater and greater numbers of Spitfires arriving via aircraft carrier and the British use of radar to concentrate their efforts took a toll, and the Fulgores were withdrawn to North Africa. In 1942, in North Africa, a need for more range was recognized, and so underwing jettisonable tanks were added to the Fulgores operating there. Dust filters were also added for desert operations, and these Fulgores were known as C202AS. The AS stands for Africa Settentrionale, which means North Africa. As 1942 dragged on, Allied air strength in North Africa built to such a point that eventually the Folgore Grupos needed to be withdrawn back to Italy. As there were no transport aircraft available for them, the Folgores somehow carried their mechanics back to Italy with them. It must have been a tight fit. Folgores also served on the Eastern Front. During the offensive phase, they performed ground attack strikes against the Red Army positions and escorted Fiat BR-20M and Caproli CA-311 bombers against Soviet targets. When the tide turned in Russia, the Corpo Aereo Italiano, or the Italian Air Corps, went on the defensive, where attrition and an increasing shortage of gasoline ammunition and spares led to a decrease in effectiveness. The last true operation of the Corpo Aereo Italiano in Russia occurred on 17th of January 1943, when a formation of 25 surviving Machi fighters composed of C-200s and C-202 Fulgores attacked some Red Army columns in support of encircled German and Italian units. Back in the homeland, Folgores were heavily involved in the defense of Sicily and southern Italy. However, these units were gradually ground down in their attacks on USAAF bomber formations. Again, the lack of heavier armament put the Folgore at a disadvantage when going head-to-head -head against the American bombers. Although a cannon-equipped upgrade to the Folgore, the C. 205 Veltro was in the works, Machi tried to add more guns to the Folgore. The problem was that there was just no space in the tightly designed fighter to add any weapons. 
So it was decided to hang a pair of gondola mounted 20 millimeter cannon with 200 rounds each under the wings to increase the Folgore's stopping power. These were known as the C202EC for Esperimento Cannoli. No, I guess that would mean experimental cannoli. Which sounds delicious, but let's try this again. Esperimento Cannoni, or the cannon experiment. They built a few of them, but it was found that the drag of the cannon hanging under the wings so diminished the aircraft's performance that it just wasn't worth it. So I guess they decided to keep the guns and drop the cannoni. Did you uh, Godfather fans get the reference there? Anyway, let, let's move on. This is getting silly. So, the Folgores were deployed in mixed formations alongside BF-109 Fs and Gs, and any of the new Machi MC-205 Veltros and Fiat G-55 Centauros. But in the end, it was attrition and the slow speed of production that meant that the Folgores and her sister fighters couldn't even protect their own factories when in April 1944, in five days of devastating attacks, the US AAF destroyed both the Fiat and Machi facilities, basically eliminating all of Italy's fighter production. By that time, about 1,150 Folgores had been built. For this episode, I've chosen to profile Teresio Vittorio Martinoli. You'll find this one interesting, as this Italian ace had kills on both sides of the conflict. Martinoli was born on the 26th of March, 1917, and had already earned his glider pilot's license by 1937. In 1938, he enlisted in the Regio Aeronautica, and after completing his training, was assigned to the 366 Squadriglia of the 155 Gruppo 53rd Stormo, with the rank of Sergente Pilota. Later, he was posted to the 384th Squadriglia 157 Gruppo. His first victory was a French Potets. 630 bomber shot down over Tunis while flying his Fiat CR-42 biplane, and he later claimed a Gloucester Gladiator. After being transferred to 4 Stormo, he began flying the Folgore. Over Malta, he knocked down three Hurricanes, two on the same day, a Blenheim bomber, and three and maybe four Spitfires. In North Africa, during the Battle of Bir Hachim in June 1942, he claimed two P-40s and damaged another. On the 29th of June, Martinoli, along with three other Folgores, attacked a formation of 12 P-40s. He downed one of them while his buddy shot down two others. In October 1942, he shot down his last Allied aircraft in North Africa which was probably a Curtis Kitty Hawk from number 260 Squadron RAF. In 1943, Martinoli was called back to Italy in defense of the homeland, and on the 4th of June, he attacked and shot down a P-38 Lightning, and he shared in knocking down a Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress over Sicily. On September 8th, Italy signed an armistice and Martinoli joined the ACI, or Aeronautica Co. Belligerante. I should have asked Rita to help me out with that one. Co. Belligerent Air Force, which would fight alongside the Allies and against his former friends in the Luftwaffe. Interestingly, some Italian pilots did not surrender to the Allies and would continue to fly with the Aeronautica Nazionale Repubblicana, or National Republican Air Force, which was known by the acronym ANR. In order to prevent Italians from actually dogfighting with each other, the ACI did not operate over Italian territory. So Martinoli and his unit were sent to attack German targets in Yugoslavia. There, he shot down a Junkers Ju-52 after fighting off its two Messerschmitt Bf-109 escorts it would be his last air victory. 
Tragically, he was killed in a flying accident in August 1944 while training on one of the second-hand Bell P-39 Aerocobras that had been transferred to the ACI. Survivors Some Folgores continued flying with the Italians and Croatians until 1948, and Egypt operated some until 1951, but only two survivors exist, and there are no airworthy examples. You can see a Folgore in the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington. It was one of the Axis aircraft brought to the U.S. for evaluation at the Air Technical Services Command. It remained in storage until 1975, when it was refurbished and given the arbitrary serial number MM9476 because no one knew where it was from. It wears the livery of 4 Stormo Wing, 10 Gruppo Squadron, and 90 Squadriglia flight that operated in Libya during the summer of 1942. There is also an example in the Italian Air Force Museum near Bracciano, Italy. This C-202 served with the Italian co-belligerent Air Force. After the war, it was used as a trainer. While you're at that museum, you can check out the Machi M-39, M-67, and MC-72 racing airplanes that competed for the Schneider Trophy. Lastly, whatever happened to Mario Castoldi? After the war, he left the world of aviation and retired. He died in 1968, so that takes us full circle, and I guess that's a pretty good place to end this episode. There are pictures of what has been described today on the World of Warbirds Facebook page, and if you like what you've heard today, give us a good review, share with your friends. Thanks. If you get some joy out of listening, please consider supporting the podcast by making a modest donation via PayPal. My PayPal address is at WOWB17. That's at World of Warbird 17, or if you want to remember it this way, at WOWB17. You'll have my eternal gratitude.